I'm speaking here with Samba Gajigo, who, with Jason Silverman, have created a, the, the film Sem Ben with an exclamation point, uh, which is opening in New York on November the 6th, 2015. So, Samba, I would like to start with asking you how long uh, you took to make the film. Uh, it took uh, Jason and I seven years to make the film once we decided we were making a film. But the gathering of the material took at least two decades. I would say the day I met Sam Ben, I already started being thinking about his biography, so I was collecting material wherever I went. So long answer is that it started decades ago, but the making of the film, really the idea emanated, uh, germinated in um, about seven years ago from start to completion. And why did you decide to do this? You are, you are his executor, and that comes, that comes up. You, you talk about this in the film. But why did you decide to make a documentary? Well, it's because I had already written three books on Semben. Uh, in 1993, and then um, in, in, 2000, in 2008, and then after he died, a book of tributes, a collection of articles. But then it really did not dawn on me. I, I knew because some men had already gone through that experience and many African artists had gone through experience. And even the U.S. now, we see a decline in readership, whereas you have an increase in the digital media on um, video, DVDs, and so on and so forth. So I thought it would be more efficient for me to reach more people out there in Europe, in the United States, in Africa, making a film on some band than just having a book. Mm -hmm. So that's the driving force. It's really an issue of efficiency and uh, reaching people outside. And, and also reaching people in, in countries where his name might be known, but maybe not as well known as it should be? Oh, definitely. For instance, here in the, in the U.S., when you go to some universities where you have uh, film studies, and so, yes, yeah, some people do know Sam Ben, and uh, some students also of film know Sam Ben, but Sam Ben is not a household name. So it is reinforcing a knowledge of Sam Ben with those who know him to introduce Sam Ben to those who do not name, know him. Mm. And so that's, w that's what we did. We took his films everywhere around the U.S., targeting those two Agencies, those who already know him, but just only scraped the surface, and those who are completely blank slate, so who needed to be brought into knowing some men. Yes, you've been you you also have been on a project of rest, restoring a lot of the films. Is that right? And and um, how is that uh, progressing? Well, it is progressing. Actually, truth be told, uh, when um, we started working on the film and I started going to Senegal and gathering Semben's papers to preserve them, we thought also that should be Semben's legacy is not only the papers he left, it is also his films. And some of which that were made in the late, early to 1860s were already in a very bad material condition. So really it's there that Jason Silverman, who very well knows the film industry, has very, very generously helped the Samben family navigate to find the, um, the how do you call it, Martin Corsese's organization, the World Film Foundation. And the, as we speak, I just received in the mail the restored copy of Black Girl and Borom Saret from the British Film Institute. Mm. So to tell you that our progress has been made, the two first films have been restored, and uh, the plan is to restore all the other films. The priority not being chronological, but looking at the films that are the most in danger right now, and the taking it from there. So we have the film, we have the film restorations, the films that are our film, of course. We have the restoration of some Ben's film, and there is also the archival for the archival material, some men's own papers, which we are trying to digitize and safeguard in an American... Well, we are going to keep the originals in an American university that can afford to digitize it, make it available to Senegalese, Africans, and the rest of the world. Crucial. Utterly crucial. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I believe that uh, Scorsese is a huge fan of Sam Ben and described him once as one of the three greatest filmmakers ever in the history of cinema. Oh yeah, during the, the Golden, I don't know what award it was, he went to, uh, on stage saying it be, either it is the Mill or Ichikok or the Senegalese Sam Ben were always caught walking on their footsteps. Mm -hmm. So he recognizes Sam Ben as being one of the giants of world cinema. It's 
so so true. D- you know, I found the structure of the film, your film, your documentary, very beautiful, very very liquid. And mm-hmm. um, first of all, can you talk about why you created the film in the way that you did, and also was Sam Ben in a sense an influence in some way of how you put the film together? Well, it's true. There was a certain. For, uh, if you are alluding, for instance, to the use of animation as chapter headings. As the original project, actually, if you see the original trailer of the film, the idea was to have uh, a character, I mean, a cartoon-like character, an African elder, uh, be the storyteller. It was an animation film, so to speak. So we took um, a team of designers from the... Um, and we took them to Senegal for two weeks. They observed, they looked, they brought material, and then we came back here. We realized we would never find the money to do this film throughout with uh, with uh, animation. But we had already been swallowed the bag of this animation. It kept coming back. It kept coming back all on our conversation. Then we decided this is what we are going to do. We are going to have a first voice narrative, narrator, which is me, and we are going to divide the film because our, really we are not talking here to sophisticated academics. We want to tell this film as if we are telling it to a 14-year-old kid. You will notice there are no jargon about post-colonialism, new colon. We don't use any of that. Straightforward storytelling. Uh, high school textbook with different chapters. And then we decided that this animation we had created would be used as chapter headings. And I think it lent a certain readability, a certain clarity, and also a certain flexibility to the film. Because you, if you don't have time to look at all chapters at the same time, you can just look at the film chapter after chapter. Uh, it also uses very it's a very interesting use of footage um, at where where you actually uh, have a you sort of set the footage like a little square inside a black uh, frame mm-hmm. and and that there's something very approachable about the mm-hmm. way you use footage would you like to talk about that well our our our, our uh, maybe not much as much as Jason could but uh, you know our good luck here as you know I told you it, it has been seven years. Most of the seven years were just dealing with two major things. Our lack of directorial experience. We had never shot or directed a film. We did not have any experience in editing. And the initial editors we had knew the technique of editing, but they lacked the sensibility that was required to get at the core of Sunday's work. The poetry of Sunday's work. The the, 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 the uniting thread in Sam Ben's work. So that's where we were lucky we got this uh, Cuban, uh, Ricardo Acosta. The day we, we met, he started talking about Franz Fanon. You cannot understand Sam Ben's work without understanding Sam Ben's post-colonial theories. Then we know we found our guy. He's a genius. He composes every. He does not make the film, uh, cut the film, and then compose music. No, he composes music in his head, and then he cut the film on the rhythm of the music. So and it turned out to be brilliant. Yes, the pacing is very. It's a very languid and very direct. It's a wonderful combination. Can you talk about the pacing? Well, yes, the pacing again. As I said, uh, I just saw a film in um, in. Uh, in Scotland, which was just it's completely dizzying, dizzying, dizzying. There's so many experimental things. Finally, you lose the, the baby with a baby shower. But this one was, it's a very, very good pace. I mean, the introduction, just talking about that, the introduction was about two and a half minutes, and the, the sequences was very good. The pace was very good. For us, it, we wanted the pace of the film to reflect the rhythm of life. And I think the film managed to do that. And it was very well balanced. There is no imbalance between the different sequences. Although the film at some point has maybe a certain tragic overturn to it when some men find himself alone, he's abandoned by everybody, he's broke, all his films have been censored. Uh, by and large, I think it is a very good, uh, goodly paced film. Yeah. 
Yes, it's, I think it's wonderfully paced, and and you yeah. very from the very beginning, almost almost like a like a speaking out of the real past, you bring your own life in, your own self, you're the one, you're the first voice, you're the narrating voice, and you talk about your boyhood in Senegal, and then that comes into how you identify with Semben, and how he, he opened your eyes, so Mm -hmm. literally, and then you move to how you meet him. So why did you decide to start with your own boyhood rather than just the meeting? Well, it is a... Uh, yeah, it's not a... De- de- in a film, you don't demonstrate. You touch people's hearts. I think uh, the reason why we decided I'm going to be the narrative voice is because when you look at my own intellectual or psychological development as a, a black man who grew up in an African context at a time when we still were in control of our images, of our stories. I was fed by my grandmother's stories, my universe limited. My village was the center of the world, if so to speak. We were the center of the world. Then the day I go to school, progressively, the center is going to be, is being moved to the periphery. The language of my grandmother is being marginalized. European languages are being full center. And the European models, Africa stopped partially, importantly partially being my point of reference. And then France took over to a point where at age 14, I I had an impossible dream of becoming white French. So what, and then at age 17, I read the men's book. It was a total fracture, mental fracture for psychology. So we de- I would decide to talk about my youth to show me being a sample of what Semben dreamed his work would accomplish. Mm. To rescue a whole generation from cultural drowning. I wanted to share the story with the world. And that's where also my story comes to be intertwined with Semben. Because I am maybe one of the few people who knew him very intimately, uh, who was his again his his protege, who was his um, who was his friend. So I had this kind of. It. I wanted to give an authentic voice I to think... talk about uh, to talk about ourselves. And if 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 you notice here, it all starts with me, and then you have the story of Semben. But after Semben died, it's me again taking Semben's walk to the bush to the countryside to fulfill his unfulfilled dream. So it is a it is a story about master and the disciple, the disciple telling the story of the master. And and you you talked about him uh, reinventing himself. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, he reinvented himself first by being as I said um, he was he left school. He left to school at age 13 because he was uh, he was uh, beat up by his French uh, French teacher. Of course, he beat back the teacher to 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 to, to blood. He made him bleed, and so he was uh, expelled from school. And what's interesting, when he came back home, he informed his dad. His dad afterwards, when you hit him, did he bleed? He said no. He said go back, make him bleed. <laughs> so some man comes back then, and he tells him, listen. You have left the school of the French. Now it's time to enter the school of life. He started teaching him fishing. But then he was such an unruly kid who challenged the entire family. So they took him to a grand uncle's house in the part of Kazama. And then they sent him to Dakar, to the capital. Dakar, uh, uh, movie theaters, uh, cosmopolitan city, uh, cartoons and so on and so forth and also diving tourists and so on so so Semben did that and then uh, religious crisis uh, at the age I would say 20 he, he he shaved his head he was chanting Quranic school all that was his quest of himself he was completely lost as a young man he lost his grounding so he does that and then when he comes back from the war he had to completely abandon the Islam uh, and he became with a very visceral anger against the colonial system. For 
the first time going into other country, he started sensing what the colonial system meant, but he still did not have the intellectual uh, profile to intellectualize it, to understand and in a systemic way, systematic way. So he go to Marseille, he get another reinvention of himself. He starts reading, he starts going to libraries, he becomes a member of the Communist Party. Then he becomes a union organizer. He participated, he picketing against all the Algerian, all the, all the wars of independence during the Cold War. And then last time he invented, well, time before last, he invented himself to become a writer. And then he invented himself to become a filmmaker. So there is something existentialist in Semben's art, like Jean-Paul Sartre. I mean, according to the existentialist philosophy, we are the drivers of our own destiny. We are responsible for ourselves. And I think that Semben, at every way, he himself said it in an in, 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 uh, interview, he said, everything in my life has been an accident. Literal accident when he broke his back in 1951, which actually allowed him to have time to, to lay down on his belly six months and to read. And accident just because he ended up in his last becoming what was not designed for him. In normal circumstances, he would have been a fisherman or a bricklayer. But he got, he got, <laughs> he got an, award, an award at the Cannes Film Festival in 2004 and awards throughout the world and is today ranked as one of the most important filmmakers in the world. So that's what I call self-reinvention. Yeah, yeah. Is, do you find, could you find an easy vocabulary to say how Sam Ben tells a story in his films that is a more African structure than a European structure? <laughs> well, certainly, I mean, many people say, yes, he has been influenced by, uh, by Asan Stein, and he also recognized that, that the battleship Potengen Guye has influence, but certainly, and Semben has said this many times during our travels to African studies, African, African students in American campuses, Go, oh, hold on. Oh, oh, go, oh, go. Let me don't stop it. Go, 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 oh, go, go to the, go to Europe, go to the United States. Absorb as much know-how as you can. But once you come back to Africa, forget everything. What did he mean? Just take the tour, because the material here you are going to deal with is different. Adapt it to Africa. So he brought the camera, the camera technique, the lightings, and so on and so forth. But certainly his style of filming, he tried to find, to invent, or to reinvent his own African estate. Do you think, finally, that um, African cinema, and uh, Semben in particular, is finding a greater voice in the culture outside of Senegal, or perhaps even in Senegal, in the classroom, you're a teacher, so do you see more interest in African cinema? Do you think it, it, that there needs to be a greater push towards exposing that? There needs to be a greater push in exposing that, because, you know, Drake, I, I'm one of those people who do not think that taste is innate in us. Taste is cultivated. It's the truth that if you go, by and large, you go to Africa, many people, many youth prefer Hollywood films. They prefer uh, Italian films. They prefer Indian films because it is those films that they are exposed to on a daily basis. But if the rules of distribution, the structures of film distribution had allowed a, a better circulation of African films in Africa, I'm sure the audience would have multiplied exponentially. Because, I mean, to be told, maybe there are some universal stories in Hollywood that resonate with them, in Indian films that resonate with them, but the films that serve them as a mirror are, at the end of the day are going to be the most important. At the bottom line, I think there is still to answer your question, Semben planted the seeds, at least for my generation. But right now there is a lot, a lot more work to do to promote those independent films. I don't think independent, I don't think Hollywood studio system cinema.
Zuma is a way for Africa in this day and age. I really don't think so. Uh, although, I mean, now the film material has become lighter, technology has been easier to access, circulation has been easier. For me, the problem is not the support, the problem is the content. Like, um, nobody should dictate an artist what they should do, but I think Semben's perception, vision uh, of filmmaking and the social and political rule, it, the role it needs to play, needs to be embraced by African filmmakers. And I think disseminated throughout our culture. The continent, well, look at the irony. This film, our film, since it came out, no, December, January 23rd, at the Sundance, we went to Cannes in May. We went to Telluride. We went to um, to we went to Australia. We went to South Africa. So, meaning since January, the film has gone everywhere, but in Africa only once. Mm. Where was that? We went to South Africa to the Durb to the Durban Film Festival. And now we also got a handful of invitation to go to to go to Senegal to Africa during the spring, but it is not governmental organizations. It is it is individual NGOs, not um, non governmental organizations. What do you think could um, change that? Could uh, raise uh, raise a different awareness in Africa? I think uh, private ent entrepreneurship. We need to create creative industries. Instead of <laughs> depending on subsidies, the government are not going to... I know the only form of cinema the government would promote would be a cinema of entertainment that would not raise consciousness of the African people. Because if you look at some bad film, they are all an anti-establishment, very vitriolic, vitriolic attack against the establishment. So what we need, at least what I'm learning from this film, is that we need to find our own true independence. And then these films make them self-reliant and self-sufficient. We have to be able to raise our own money to sustain our own film and to do our own distribution. Therefore, being able to convey our, our, our message. What we want is twofold. To create an industry, but an industry that does not lose sight of its political and social mission. Actually, it is a social and economic mission, a uh, political mission that is going to drive the industry. Do you think that Senegal could possibly lead in this way, or do you think there are other countries that could lead? Well, we hope, we hope Senegal had led in the 60s when the Festival of Black Art was organized in 1966. Senghor had created um, uh, how do you call it again? The theater. Uh, she had the creative showrooms and so on and so forth. But since the 80s, and the, the encroaching of the uh, International Monetary Fund on our government, so the wild privatizations under the pressure of the World Bank for African, for non, for yeah, for all third world country to 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 privatize, to denationalize. Everything went to private, so more and more our governments cannot afford, or let's say even if they can afford, subsidizing culture is the least of your pri is their priority because they have millions of people to feed. It is a tough choice to make to give, say, for instance, a um, uh, million dollar to make a film while you have people in the neighborhood who do not have drinking water. I recognize it is a tough choice. So I think it's really private enterprise that can develop cinema in Africa today. I mean, private enterprise, people who come into it. Yes, we need to make money to be sustainable, but also our sustainability is geared towards making a difference in our societies. I, I think it's so interesting because a film like yours is very good at raising consciousness, consciousness because as you described it, it's very uh, user-friendly, it is yeah. not intimidating, and therefore I think it, it a film like this can be very effective in um, drawing people to this subject, which is such a fun, I mean, African cinema in general is a very fill, filled with talent. 
Mm-hmm. And um, I think, of course, you're also talking about changing the, the 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 direction that the culture has gone in. Our culture, the world culture, yeah. which is not mm-hmm. towards political activism per se, though that's certainly around. Yeah. But um, I think that melding could, you know, the melding of a of a very direct, but also a very approachable, very warm. It's a very intimate and warm film uh, right. that right. that right. could raise, draw audiences and raise people's interest in Semben and then in in what you're describing that would that might follow. Yeah, and it has a very powerful ideological and psychological role to play because what the film or what the men's films are doing is really to serve as a mirror to African people. Here are what your problems are. Look at yourself from your own perspective. Now, do you want to live like, is this what you want? Or is this what something you want to change? But at least he offered us a daily mirror of our daily lives. It is not, <coughs> it is not a broken mirror which is manufactured by the West or by any other, other, other person. That's why if you look at the introduction of the film, some men said, if Africa does not create its own images, Africa is going to disappear. Because <laughs> as human beings who are not only made of flesh and blood, who are made of stories, he who makes the story controls the social and the political relationship. Mm. Yeah. The media in the West, I mean, what is the power in the media? <laughs> if you go here in a campaign, the person, the candidate who has more money, more access to the media is a winner. Um, I think that uh, it it's you're hitting on points that are what what really art should be and what cinema should be, which is not separated from politics, from ordinary feet on the ground life and uh, oh, art, art, art is political art is very political now we have two kinds of arts you have what I would call the upper class or bourgeois art the art uh, when you have a painting of 140 million dollar in a museum <laughs> which is not accessible to the people that's only for the elite for their own that's why uh, for instance yeah, there is this critic Tolstoy who talks about art he said I is not a pleasure I is not as for beauty because if you close art into those two categories beauty and pleasure you are just designing it for a small elite but rather art should be considered as a means of communication it talks to emotions. It talks to the majority. That is what popular art is. But right now, with the commodification of culture in our capitalist system, art is going more and more far away from the people. Closed in museums, not accessible to everybody. And what is worse, sponsored by corporate America, meaning the corporations are in incorporating our cultural expression. Even if you go now to Guggenheim Metropolitan Museum or whatever museum of the moving image, you go to some displays for instance, this one is made possible by Coca-Cola. So there is a corporatization. I think Noam Chomsky wrote a lot about this, the corporatization of American culture. Well, where do you think a film like yours, uh, Sam Ben with an exclamation point, um, fits into this landscape? Well, it's, it's that it was such an excellent question because we agonized into it. We had to have sponsors. We had to have investors, meaning, as Sam Ben said, sometimes you sleep with the devil to make what you want to do. We could, if, we could not avoid the film industry at all. When you look at our film, it has all the features of the film of the film industry. Look at our long credits. Look at our division of labor. You have the writers, you have the music composers, you have this, you have the consultant, you have the lawyer. So we fell into that mold. We did. But
But again, I think, I mean, I'll let you be judge of that, we manage within that frame to create a content that is different. It is not a film about Kiss Kiss and Bang Bang. It is not a film about Trigger Happy and just romantic love and things like that. We created a certain, it would infuse the content in the, the frame with political message, with a social message, the importance, the power of art and of creative art. Well, the film has had a, actually very, a, a huge reception, a huge good reception. So do you see that as a litmus test here of something that's happening, a change? I think so. I think so. I mean, if you look at all the reviews, or maybe just 50 percent of the reviews, what people liked about the film is the new blood it brings, hmm. the innovation it brings, the new idea. Hollywood is tired. Hollywood is exhausted. And I film, I also think the ground we we broke is you usually many biographical documentaries are rather hagiographic documentaries. It is just to sing the praises of the subject. We did that too. We celebrated his achievements where they needed to be celebrated, but also to humanize him, to show him that he is just a George Plummer, but who also managed. Actually, I call him, uh, in many interviews, I call him an ordinary man who did extraordinary things. I think, I think that's very much the way the film comes across. Yeah. And I think that is a great achievement. Do you feel that um, this is something that really could make a mark here? I think so. I think so. I mean, even for the last two weeks, every day I come to my office, I have at least two invitations around the world to take the film. So I think the, the, the response is very, very, very positive. Yes, I think so. Well, the response is very, very positive. Samba, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? Well, just... Uh, mm, we just hope with this film we will inspire, uh, inspire generations of storytellers filmmakers, cultural activists to look at the Semben model, Semben's message, the role that storytelling can play in social relationship and in political relationship, the way that, as I said earlier, as social beings who are not only made of flesh and blood, who are made of stories from crypt to, from crypt to grave. All our life is regulated through stories. Yeah. And I hope people will see in these stories, contrary to colonial stories, they'll see in these stories <laughs> alternatives. That's the word I was looking for. To situation, to images of oppression, spoliation, humiliation, dehumanization, disappropriation you see in the media about blacks and Africans. Semben is offering alternative images of self-empowerment, of courage, of struggle, of success, of failure. In some, we hope this film will project to the world a humanized image of Africans. I think it is a great success, this film. So I'm very happy to have had the opportunity to talk to you about Thank it. Thank you. And I know that... Thank you, you for your continued support, oh. too. Listen, uh, we are, we are all into this. <laughs> it's been my utter pleasure, I tell you. Um, so I uh, thank you so much, Samba.